Hi, I'm Alex Howard, and welcome to the show. And my guest in the studio today is Timber Hawkeye, author of Buddhist Boot Camp. And in today's interview, we're going to be talking about Timber's story and the journey to Buddhist Boot Camp. So, welcome, Timber. So, how did this all come about for you? I was working in the corporate world as a paralegal at a law firm, and one day, one of the other paralegals was celebrating her 20-year anniversary at the firm. And the fact that she was celebrating 20 years in a cubicle terrified me. <laughs> I got a glimpse of what my life was going to look like if I didn't make any changes. Yeah. So I decided to sell everything I own and move to Hawaii to lead a very simple and uncomplicated life. Wow. That's a very dramatic response, though, to something like that. You know, there's, there's a lot of ways you could have responded. What, w was there something that was, had birthed in you before, an interest in a change in your life, or was it something that just in that moment you were like, I have to do something different? Um, when I moved from San Francisco to Seattle five years prior to that, I had taken a 50% pay cut. Uh -huh. And that moment, um, when I realized I, how happy I am has nothing to do with how much money I was making, mm kick-started the whole thinking process as to what am I going to do one day when I'm debt-free and I can just work less and live more. Mm -hmm. Hawaii seemed like an obvious choice uh, because I love being outdoors and it's warm year-round. So I moved there and my friends asked that I keep in touch with them. And that's, that's what started the process is I would write them emails every month to let them know what my life was like. And the benefit of working less is that I could study more. Mm -hmm. um, and what I enjoy studying is uh, people's belief systems and psychology simultaneously so I can understand not so much what people believe, but why they believe what they do. Yes. And so the emails to my friends became deeper in meaning every month. And at what point um, my friends asked that I make it public. Mm -hmm. And essentially the book is a collection of about seven or eight years of emails mm -hmm. that I had sent out to my friends. Uh, and what, what was the reaction in your friends when you made this, this huge change in your life? I mean, it, it's not just that you left the corporate world to go traveling. You went, you went to live in a monastery. That's a, it's, a really, it's a huge change, a very courageous thing to do. W were they cynical, skeptical, mm. jealous? W what was <laughs> their response? Um, initially, I didn't move into a monastery. I just moved to Hawaii. And, you know, but th they knew my intention was to simplify. But yes, because they've always known timber to be you know, living in the condo downtown with a sports car, with the Italian designer furniture and following the recipe to happiness that we all think mm -hmm. would lead us there. My taking a step outside of the rat race, so to speak, um, as my friend Laura said, it was, she was shocked, but she wasn't surprised oh, okay. in the sense that she saw it happen. I think it would have been more courageous actually to stay at the law firm and yeah. work for attorneys for 20 more years than it was to move into the unknown. Yeah, I think often when someone makes a big life change like that, it's like for the people around them, there's something which somewhat wishes they could do the same thing. Yeah. But also it's, it's you know, I hear what you're saying. It, it, in some ways, it, for you, it would have been more difficult to stay. Yeah. But also leaping into that unknown, it takes a lot of courage to yeah. do that. And, and some friends were jealous. I mean, my own, my boss, my, the attorney I was working with, it, when I went into his office to tell him, you know, after working with him for five years, he knew. He just looked at me and he said, you're moving, aren't you? And I said, yeah. <laughs> and it, his only response was, I, I wish I could as well. Yeah. So yeah. he was very, very supportive of my transition. Yes. And, and when you arrived at the monastery, so you, you went to Hawaii for a while and then you decided to move into the monastery so yeah so after a while of living in hawaii um i decided to, you know to simplify my life even more and moving to a monastery was i think an inevitable step at one point mm -hmm. and uh, that took simplifying it to a whole new sure. level um, but again the idea is to at least temporarily eliminate the external stimuli mm -hmm. and look within and i th and at 
what I realized is that our purpose here is to learn to be completely selfless. And after being at the monastery for a while, the same friends I used to contact via email weren't getting those emails anymore because the monastery was off the grid yes. with no electricity or cellular connection or anything, part of what made it so wonderful. And when they would handwrite me letters saying, you know, we would love for you to come back out, I realized that on this journey to selflessness, my staying at the monastery would have actually been the most selfish thing I could do. Oh, that's very interesting. I want to come back to that in a moment, but I'm, I'm really interested. When you first arrived at the monastery, you know, it's like, I'm wondering, was there a moment where you realized what you'd done, that suddenly you're in robes, you're off the grid, and was it initially, I guess, there was an excitement, or was there a moment where it was like, wow, my life is just, it's completely different. What was, what was that transition? What was that process like? It was a good fit. It felt like home almost immediately. Mm. Um, I had been in robes prior to moving to the monastery. Okay. So putting on the robes was really just a reminder of the vows that I had taken. When you take the monastic vows in the way it's similar to getting married and you put on a wedding ring and it's mm -hmm. like, okay, this is my life now. And I knew even then that the robes were um, only to be worn until the day when they would no longer be necessary. Yes. If that makes any sense. Yes. Yeah. As you were in that chapter of your life where you were in robes, you were in the monastery, can you say something about the effect that had on your own practice to really go much deeper within without all of those distractions? Uh, what happened for you in, in your own process? Interestingly enough, moving uh, into a monastery which you would think would be very rigid and very hardcore, mm -hmm. Uh, my own practice has actually been very rigid, and I haven't been very gentle with myself at all. Um, the pendulum just swung from one extreme to the other. And when I uh, was first introduced to meditation, it was something that I had to do every single day without a break, without any, any forgiveness for any slack or a anything of the sort. And it was at the monastery, actually, where they give you a day off where you don't have to come <laughs> and go and sit with the rest. And it was initially absurd to me and the um, practice leader asked me, you know, what do you think would happen if you miss a day? And it was an invitation to, to look at how attached I was to non-attachment, mm -hmm. so to speak. Yeah. And yeah. letting go had been the first of many letting goes that's been really liberating. Yes. Because you know, I'm, I'm aware from reading your book, you, you've had somewhat of a life of extremes in a sense. And it's interesting that it's like you'd had the extreme of the external world, then you'd swung to this extreme of monastic mm -hmm. life. Yeah. And yet within that environment, you'd actually found a place of, or begun to found a place of balance. Yeah, um, I think it's by experiencing those extremes that you then know where the center is. Yes. And I don't think we need to go to those extremes. It was just, I was so prone to the very militant and black and white rigid industry, which I worked in for yes. so long. And so I experimented the boundaries, and then I would have a reference point of what the middle is. Mm -hmm. And now I can sense whenever I veer too far to one side yes. or the other. Yes. And so you said a little bit earlier that when you decided to leave the monastery, it was that you recognized that although, in a sense, it was you felt very at home there, and it was a place that felt you know, very supportive for yeah. you, there was a recognition that somehow you weren't supporting the, the, the wider world. You weren't contributing to, no. to society. Say, say more about that. I realized that I was of no use to the outside world. If I kept myself tucked away at a monastery somewhere, mm -hmm. yes, I enjoyed it. But you know, it, even with just my close group of friends who would write to me and say, we realized that you, you're still, you, <laughs> They're still in the corporate world, in the cubicle, working their, their um, lives away, and that they're not yet in a position to, in a sense, give it all up or quit their job and, and simplify their lives. The fact that I was one of them at one point and left it gave them hope yeah. that the, the fluorescent lit cubicle is not the end-all, be-all, that there is life after it. And and it can be whatever we want it to be. We're not defined by those experiences. Um, it's just a step on our journey. Yes, yes. And of course, the fact that 
you had lived the life that they'd lived and you'd had this chapter of your life that you'd lived in the monastic life mm -hmm. in a monastery of course that makes you much more accessible to people um, and people people can relate to your teaching perhaps in a way that they might not someone that's only lived a monastic life yeah and it's it's definitely not my teaching there's nothing i'm just sharing my life with them and even not being in robes makes me more accessible i realized that staying in robes was not in line with my values because what it had essentially done is it separated me from others. Mm -hmm. It created a sense of, oh, he's there and we're here, mm -hmm. or it, it just, it, it, it was counterproductive yeah. to, to celebrate the unity of us by segregating and separate, so yeah. But you know, one of the things that I find really interesting, uh, we had a bit of a discussion when we met the first time last week, that you still follow your monastic vows yeah. even though you live a, a lay life. Mm -hmm. That's really interesting. Uh, so, say, say more about that. It's challenging, you know. Yeah. The, the monastery provides you with a, a really great container mm -hmm. and support with which to eliminate some of the external stimuli that makes it so challenging to maintain the vows. Mm -hmm. um, but the real practice isn't to to live up to them in that container mm -hmm. but to take them back into the real world and go yes this is this is doable and my life is my message and i can lead by example by the way i live my life because you know, my sister told me one time oh timber you live in a completely different world than i do and i, I don't we all live in the same world i just look at it from a different perspective yes yes so you, you left the monastery mm -hmm. and you came back into worldly life, but continuing with your monastic vows. It was, a, it was a gradual transition. I went from there to a lay practitioner's temple. Okay. So imagine a monastery with Wi-Fi. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay. <laughs> so you're in a monastery with Wi-Fi. And at that point, you resumed sending these updates out to your, to your friends and your network. I'm, I met... Um, with my friend Kim and she encouraged me to go back to all the emails that I had sent out over the years and put them in a public place where people can come and read them and that was the birth of the blog and the, the Facebook page where for the first year uh, my name wasn't attached to it at all it was just the content and it spread like wildflowers it was, it was great after a year I uh, compiled some of the most popular posts and into a little tiny paperback manuscript mm -hmm. that I had self-published and it just went I guess viral is yeah. the word and um, it was it was really interesting to see how many people could relate to it but the difference was I then had a name you couldn't publish a book without your name on it yes. so it was really important for me that now that my name is on it that I share some of my story of me um, to make it more relatable, mm -hmm. to make it more personal rather than me sitting there just spewing out knowledge that I've accumulated along, the, but actually life experiences. Mm -hmm. And that was a really big transition for Buddhist Boot Camp to go from this abstract you know, uh, theory of concepts that would sound um, like it would make sense, but it wouldn't be tangible mm -hmm. into how can people apply this into their daily lives? And that was a big transition. People were able to relate and the messages spread much farther and wider because the invitation really is to be honest and transparent. Yes. So now that my name was on it, and before I say, think, or do anything, I cross-reference it with my values and I make sure that it's in line with those values. Now that my name was on the book, I needed to be, I needed to share of me. Mm -hmm. And that's, yeah, that's what ended up happening. Yeah, you know, and, and uh, the Facebook page at, at this point, as we're recording, has 230,000 likes. You know, I was saying to you the other night, that's the equivalent of filling um, the biggest football stadium or, or soccer stadium, you would mm -hmm. say, in, in this country three times over. Yeah. Uh, that's a huge number of people. Um, and I think you said it was growing by around 1,000 a day. And that's just a huge... Um, evolution of yeah. that and it, it seems to me that a big part of that what feeds that is the honesty mm -hmm. of what you're sharing and I'm wondering 
what that process has been like for you personally to, mm -hmm. you know, because I, I know that you very much consider yourself someone who's just sharing their experience yeah. rather than being a teacher. Yeah. And yet, of course, some people will see you as a teacher. And I'm curious as to how that process has been for you, being so open and so vulnerable. And yeah, what, what effect that's had on, on, on yeah. your, your process. I th it, it has made me feel more connected with others. I've heard from people that the reason we're not honest, more honest with one another is um, a lot of it is fear-based of being judged. And I haven't been judged f for when I share some of my experiences. That's when people feel like they can connect with me. If I was to sit here and ask you about what your biggest insecurity is, you'd probably stutter and try to avoid answering that question. But if someone else shares their insecurity, a room full of people would raise their hand and go, yes, me too. And that's the invitation, is someone has to be the first one to step up and say, it's okay to talk about this. We're all battling similar demons, so to speak, and it's so internal, um, which just eats us up on the inside, and we really want to connect with others. And social media has, in a way, provided us the platform with which to do it, but we only share the Photoshopped edition version of our lives. You know, it's very much a selected, only, only the best of the best, and it's not a true representation of who we are, and then no one really knows us, and, and we're still left. We could, we could have 3,000 friends and still feel alone. I, and one of the things that I find so interesting is that generally what mediums like Facebook can do is they, as you say, they give us much more um, span, but they give us less depth in terms yes. of our contact. Yeah. And yet something clearly happens with Buddhist boot camp and the way people connect with it. Yeah. You know, the, the uh, talk you gave in London last week, I remember saying to you beforehand, you know, us Brits can be a little reserved and, you know, y it may take a while for the audience to kind of open up and, and reveal something. And it was quite striking that I think it was the first or the second person to speak mm -hmm. was deeply vulnerable yeah. about something that was very personal yeah. in a room full of 70 or so people. Maybe that doesn't surprise you anymore. It doesn't, because that's the invitation. Yes. It's they see someone else who has absolutely no fear of being vulnerable, and they say, this is a safe place for me to do that. And they feel so relieved having done it, you know, and... and it's, I think, our greatest strength to be that vulnerable, that honest, that transparent, and, and own up to it because the minute we admit to ourselves where we are in life, then we know where, where we can, what we can change in order to live more in line with our values. Mm -hmm. And that's why there's not a single should statement in the book that says this is what you should do. It's, you know, take a look at yourself, figure out what kind of person you want to be, and then cross-reference that with your behavior, with your emails, with your text messages, with your online posts, and say, is my behavior in the world in line with my values? And it's, it's wonderful when people take it on, and I hear back from so many saying, I'm, I'm motivated to be the best version of me there is. And that's just been the greatest um, gift, I think, that this book could have offered to others. And I'm forever grateful and anyone who wants to say thank you to me really should direct their gratitude to my friend Kim um, it was her who said you need to make this available mm. uh, worldwide and, uh, and was that a difficult decision for you to do that it was because when people suggested she wasn't the only one who suggested I write a book but whenever someone did I thought well pff, why everything I'm saying has already been said there's nothing in the book we don't already know and it's all been written before. And people would say, well, your story hasn't. Mm -hmm. And I said, but it's not about me. It's, it's not about the messenger. It's about the message. And the message is ancient. And that's when some of the feedback came in that said, yes, but you've taken an ancient message and made it a, a, available for people to understand yes. in this day and age. And that's, that's, I think, the difference in it. And, you know, every chapter is only about a page long. Sure. And uh, because they were all emails and our attention spans quite short these days. So, it, and really every chapter was written about a month apart. So they're not written in any order. You can just flip to any random page and read that. And whether you agree with it or not is irrelevant because it, it still gives you something to think about. And if you don't agree with it, you just say, okay, and flip mm -hmm. on to the next page. And it's not about convincing you or changing yes. your mind or 
it, despite the title, there's really nothing in there about Buddhism. Well, that, that was one of my questions. Yeah. It, it's, it's a kind of ironic thing in a sense that it's a book called Buddhist Boot Camp. And in fact, wh why don't you share what, what, what you <laughs> wanted to call the book? Because I, I, it's kind of sweet. Oh, it's every time I watched the movie um, Fight Club, uh -huh. I thought to myself, that is Buddhist Boot Camp. Okay. Um, it takes you know, some of the greatest Buddhist principles and how to apply them in today's life. And it, it really just, without any sugar coating, just slaps you across the face with them. And I'm not in any way encouraging or people to go out and watch the movie. It is extremely violent and graphic. But where I was in life at the time, it, it spoke to me in a language that I could understand with that rigidity, with that just straightforward. And that's what resonated and so the book, again, is just my personal journal. And so if I was to give my diary a name, Buddhist Boot Camp would be mm -hmm. a really good fit. Yeah, and I think part of it as well is there's a sense of you, what I would call perhaps being a reluctant teacher, in a sense that, you know, I understand it's not a teaching, but mm -hmm. there's something which can teach people something about themselves and about the world. And that's, I think, part of its accessibility, uh, mm. you know, and part of what is beautiful about it. Um, I'm interested, we've got about a minute and a half left. I'm interested, where would you like to see this evolve? And I understand that it's very much something which has its own evolution to yes. it. But what, what, what's your hope for the book and for the future? My hope is that for every book ordered, at least four people read it, that it doesn't end up sitting on a shelf somewhere, but that it's shared. That's when it has its most value. It's not my book, it's ours. Um, it is being used in schools um, as part of the curriculum, and I'm working with correctional facilities so that inmates um, get a free copy of the book along with um, free yoga and meditation classes. So I would love to see it in the hands of more people that we think it can help, and then continually moving forward. Mm. Great, and maybe this is a final point. Say something about the T-shirts, because um, I first came across you and across the book, uh, a friend of mine on a retreat, was wearing one of the Buddhist boot camp t-shirts. Yes. Um, so we've only got a few seconds, but I don't know if you just want to very briefly just say the story it's of how that just, came about. It's um, just a guy and his wife who live in Seattle, Washington, who love the book and the message within, and they hand print the shirts in the garage. And I, when they contacted me saying, we want to make these shirts to help promote the message, I said, you can do that as long as it's in line with my values. And so when you order the shirts online, um, you select which nonprofit the proceeds go to. So it's all in line with the intention to awaken, enlighten, enrich, and inspire. It's beautiful. Well, Timber, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you for watching. And you can find out more about Timber and the book at www.buddhistbootcamp.com. Thank you for watching.